Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's 7.30. Um, before we begin, I think many of us here know that Graham Bloomer, our head of place, is um, unwell. So on behalf of councillors and his fellow officers, I'd like to extend our sympathy to his wife and children as in this difficult time when they help him to recover. So, are there any apologies for absence? No. Declarations of interest. Uh, the minutes on page 3 to 12. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Carter. I was in the table. We'll note that, David, thank you. Other than that, are you happy? Thank you. Um, any matters arising from the minutes of the previous meeting? So we move on to item five, written questions from the public. There are none. Item six, written questions from councillors. There are none. Item seven, petitions. There are none. Item eight, pages 13 to 26, the forward plan. <coughs> Councillor Hart. Um, this is a question not surprisingly to Danny Burton. Um, in light of the publication of East Hart's um, local plan by the inspector, um, which has in included several items which are of interest to Harlow, one, that uh, Gilston may have more than 3,000 houses, uh, that there will be two crossings to the River Stort, um, and that the sustainable transport link has been specifically removed from the reference um, can you give us an update on the Harlow local plan? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. I only just got back from holiday like last night. I haven't had a chance to catch up. As soon as I have, I'll give you a full report. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, we come to recent decisions taken by. Recent decisions taken by the League of Deputy of the Body Holder, um, and there are none. So, item 10, year in 2017-18 Joint Finance and Performance Report, <coughs> pages 27 to 61. I'm moving this motion. Second to change. Thank you. Councillors, what is success? The dictionary tells us it's the accomplishment of an aim, a positive result, a favourable outcome. The 2017-18 Joint Finance Performance Report shows this Labour Council, united in purpose and resolve, have accomplished our aim of delivering sound financial management. We have produced the positive result of efficiently delivered improved services, whilst planning the favourable outcome of a secure and prosperous future for the residents of Harlow. Many organisations boast about their plans to make efficiency savings next year. We plan to do exactly that to the tune of a million pounds next year. But thanks to excellent work by our team of officers, we can have confidence that ours is no idle boast because Harlow has achieved a £610,000 saving a year early contributing to a 2017-18 budget underspent. But efficiency savings must be made without affecting the services our hard-working residents depend upon. And we've done just that. Harlow's Labour Council has performed on or above target for 49 out of 53 performance indicators. And of the 238 milestones due to be reached in delivering the corporate plan, 202 were successfully completed. The Council also benefited from HDS, Harlow's own local authority trading company, that delivered improving environmental and property maintenance services, whilst at the same time making valuable contributions to the tune of half a million pounds to our budget underspend. 
bringing these services back from the profit-taking private sector has been hugely beneficial. These measures, together with some windfalls, has led to a total underspend of £1,276,000. And this underspend was achieved by Harlow's Labour-led council at the same time that we managed to invest in our community. We secured the financial future of both the Playhouse and Pets Corner. We invested in our community safety team. We committed a million pounds to improve the look of and to tidy up neighbourhoods and estates across the town. And we put aside funding for any further fire safety measures to council tower blocks once the Grenfell Tower public inquiry has concluded. And we did all this at the same time as delivering a 1% rent reduction for council tenants, making no compulsory redundancies and with no hollow council tax increase for residents. Sound economic management allows us to make further provision for the future and puts me in a place where I can announce exciting investment for the benefit of all residents. Much of the underspend will be used to create a new reserve of half a million pounds to guarantee that any additional administrative costs associated with the local plan and the garden town developments can be fully funded. We are planning the most fundamental wide-ranging change to Harlow since Gibbon began work on the master plan of Harlow in 1947. We must get it right and we must show our neighbouring authorities we have the resources ready and are serious about our resolve to make the duty to cooperate work for Harlow and remind them that it is now their turn to show the same commitment in cash terms to make it happen. But the single item of investment paid for from the underspend and receipts arising from Rams Gorks that gives me the most pleasure to announce is our plan to modernise and thus guarantee the future of Harlow's iconic paddling pools. We're faced with a huge bill to bring the paddling pools up to current day health and safety standards. And love them as I do, I feel a sense of frustration that we've not been able to open them for the public during the hot dry spell we've experienced. A hot dry spell that will no doubt end next week as soon as the school summer holidays close. <laughs> So rather than invest in the status quo, it is our intention to replace the paddling pools over a period of two years with new, modern splash parks of the type you can see projected on the wall behind me now. Offering increased usability, lower maintenance costs and a better, safer, more exciting experience for all the children of this town. But this administration is not complacent. Our aim going forward is to work with businesses, neighbouring authorities and community groups to build on our success, to hold a microscope up to those areas that need improvement so that we continue to deliver more and better housing, to deliver regeneration to help the local economy thrive, to foster well-being and social inclusion and to deliver a cleaner, greener environment so that Harlow is a place that allows our children to grow up happy and successful so that families enjoy security and prosperity, and so that older citizens can enjoy retirement with dignity. Success indeed. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Chair, thank you. Um, thank you for that, because it, it is very important. I think. <coughs> and, uh, Kelly Wright, for next year as well. Um, basic, uh, message from this report from my perspective is uh, very good control of service budgets and congratulations to the officers. Um, uh, after allowing for um, variations of the uh, projected outcome, we did report this really in December when the government actually provided unexpectedly uh, more money uh, for, 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 in regards to some of the services. Um, there's an underspend of 1.2 million now, and as you've explained, we're going to use that money uh, in a variety of ways. Um, we've taken note of um, the 600,000 underspend, which relates to savings um, in regards to uh, services, and we've actually put that back in, in, in the budget. Uh, the proposals set out within the report include further investment in the local communities, as you've already uh, uh, indicated improving and enhancing the services the council provides to its residents, <coughs> ensuring that we deliver environmental and health benefits despite the reductions in the council's core funding uh, by the government. The government is still very unclear in regards to the future of local government uh, finance. I gather from the local government conference, um, 
a few weeks ago, there, there still was no indication about how the local authorities, local authorities nationally, can cope with um, uh, the business rates. Um, people are actually interested in the details of the report. I draw their attention to pages 46, uh, 44 to 46, which explain, uh, give an explanation for some of the variations. Uh, chairperson, thank you. <coughs> questions? Um, yes, sir. Oh, questions. Um, so we're on questions. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Chair. Um, notice from the report that you're thinking of putting £119,000 into severance reserves. Um, Can you give us a page number? Appendix C. Pardon? Appendix C. Appendix C. Um, I wondered what the justification rationale was for that. Do you have a page number for that? Uh, page 61. Quite a weighty touch. It'd be very useful if we had. Um, okay. uh, I'm going to pass that on to uh, Mr. Fru. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the um, as uh, members will be aware, um, the severance reserve was removed from the council's budget uh, for the current financial year and uh, the remaining budget that was held uh, in 1718, uh, that will be the final year of contribution, um, and from there on there will be no further additions to the fund. We have a number of questions for you. Is it, so, so, so this contribution is being made, I think I've got that. So is it really wise, given the underspend that we've just talked about, that we're putting so much into a service reserve that we don't think is, all, is already at two, over two million pounds. We're not planning on making any redundancies soon, as far as I understand from the administration. Putting more money in. Would it be better put it towards services that the council's cut back on previously? I, I cite, for example, the removal of adult nappy waste collections last year. Um, the administration halted that. It only cost 30,000 pounds. That's a political decision. Is it possible to reverse that decision? We have a budget obviously every year, we can actually look at that if that's, that's been suggested. Uh, but generally, the uncertainty that the Tory government continues to provide for local authorities means that we have to make these, these kinds of provisions. And government was not just Harlow Council, but councils up and down the country, was quite unexpected. It's no way to run a local government. Local, local government was actually promised three years of stability by Osborne, and he's now what, running the, the press in London, isn't he? Um, we need certainty, we need security, we need to know how local government is going to be properly financed. And without that, we've got to be very prudent. Thank you. Councillor Um The improvements to paddling pools is welcome. Um, I have many fond memories of using them myself, my friends and family. I just wanted to know, however much I like them, is this a wise use of council resources? Um, look, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Mark. Look, it, this isn't a zero-sum game. It's not that we're not going to have to spend some money on the paddling courts. As they stand at the moment, we're in a position where health and safety is likely to insist that we put up safety fences around them. They're quite deep. They're not fenced off. Um, and the fen to put adequate fences up around the five existing paddling pools is hugely expensive. They have filters which are cleaned every year but really need the sand digging out with who knows what we'll find at the bottom. Um, the concrete is cracked, we very often have to uh, caulk the cracks to make them work. Now look, so we are faced with a huge bill just to maintain the status quo possibly of the order, uh, I've been advised, of about £500,000. Now look, we've got f families that um, perhaps used to holiday abroad, who can't do so because Brexit has caused the um, sterling to crash. We've got families in England who, thanks to all oh, 10 years of below inflation pay rises, um, of a sort not seen since Napoleon, <laughs> the times of Napoleon, can't even afford a trip to um, South End. So 
what we're doing is ensuring that everybody, every child in Harlow, regardless of the size of their parents' bank balance, gets an opportunity this summer to enjoy some sort of, this not summer, this summer and summers going forward, to enjoy um, time in the outdoors in our splash pool. So yeah, I don't think it is money well spent. Yeah, sorry, councillor. So, um, thank you, Jay. So, asking questions about prudence and spending money um, in that vein. We learned this week that the administration is spending £83,000 on PR consultants. Yeah. Are they um, spending this money wisely? Has due diligence been undertaken to spend that money? Or is it simply because they have an underspend in the general fund they feel justified they can spend it on whatever they want? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor Perrin, I think the decision to uh, go with thinking places preceded my tenure as uh, leader of this council and certainly preceded our knowledge about this underspend, but I'll pass it over to <coughs> Councillor Hart. And, and just to ask, when you say due diligence, um, are you referring to the procurement process? We are. So yes. Yes. Yeah, well, I, as I said this morning, uh, uh, I spoke to officers very closely on that subject because as I was neither involved in the procurement either, <coughs> I certainly didn't want to go on the radio and say um, that it was uh, fine, but it wasn't. And I satisfied having spoken to Jane and others that uh, a tender document was put together, that five agencies were identified, that five agencies were spoken to and invited to tender. They were all interested. None of them expressed any concern with the tender document or thought that it was, um, you know, inappropriate or difficult to respond to or costed inappropriately. In the event, um, only two chose to pitch. And a panel which comprised, I should say, uh, representatives of the voluntary sector, representatives of local prisoners. So it really wasn't just um, council officers making the decision, chose thinking place and uh, on the basis that uh, it was the best uh, proposal and that was entirely within council standing orders. Lovely, thank you very much, um, Eugene. Now look, we're here thank to... Uh, Sorry, we've got more questions. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. Item 10 is about the joint finance and performance reports. So I'm going to close down that line of question now. Oh, there, there, are, there, are questions, there are questions about the report. Yeah, um, that's fine. Do carry on. Thank you very much for allowing me the time to ask questions about the report. I feel ever grateful. So on page 53, um, <laughs> performance indicators, under HCS 2.1b, the routine uh, cleansing of streets, um, the level of land and highways um, being deemed unacceptable in terms of detritus has shot up um, to over 24%. Could I have an explanation as to why we feel that's happened? Because the report doesn't really go into too much detail. Uh, uh, well, I thought, it went, I thought it went into quite a lot of detail, actually, and it puts forward a proposal for addressing the particular problem. Um, if you want to come and discuss the finer details with me, I'm quite happy to do that. But, this isn't really the place to talk about detritus, is it? And what sort of detritus we're talking about and which, which uh, surveyor did the job and how that's changed with the people who do the surveying for us. This isn't really the place to discuss those sorts of details. And it is um, my understanding that we are back on track. Of course. So, oh, well, if I can ask the question, I wouldn't have known that, would I, Councillor? Because it's not in the published document. And to, be, and, to be fair, and to be fair, um, Mr. Ingle, I think, this isn't I think actually, Councillor Perry, it is in the document. <laughs> uh, if you look at the last sentence, which is NB, the KBT survey for quarter one 2018 19 now has, um, has now taken place, the KPI performance has increased to 5.0. It's increased. Yeah. So increased. It's increased. It's increased. Um, So it's decreased then? No. no. <laughs> in, in, in the positive way, you know it, it's just you say the report problem. Thank you. I, I've still got so questions, thank you. You may well have, as long as they're about um, the report that's... That one was in the report, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
Good. And it is okay to ask questions about things like this here because. Um, Council, to get on oh, I'm just double checking. <laughs> I don't want to be asking questions I shouldn't be asking. Well, we'll try it and see. Oh, right. Okay, thank you. Good idea. Right, next one then, page 56, CO2 reduction. Mm -hmm. So we've massively failed that target, um, pumping an extra 83 tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, the measures mentioned in the report seem rather reactive and proactive since they relate in part to ageing boilers. We know the age of the boilers. Um, why was this not anticipated and taken into account before we hit the very cold season that we had? Um, in fairness, I think when we've looked at replacing boilers, uh, we've been asked repeatedly not to do this over the winter period. So that's short of the window of opportunity to do this. So um, it is certainly... It is certainly not a figure we're proud of. We do want to take practical steps, and those practical steps that we're going to take which will reduce this are in the report. Okay, thank you, Chair. My next question, having read the report, there's no mention of a review of the Council's um, remaining heating provision that it has across its portfolio. It only mentions a couple of specific sites. Would it not be sensible to do a review whilst it's warm of all of the council's heating provision. If, if the chair excuses me, I know he wants to take questions about this particular agenda item, but the next agenda item is very clear reference to the five-year programme we've got, already got in place to replace all our heating programmes. This, what you're in item 10, you're referring to particular <coughs> sites in item number 11, you will see that we've got a five-year rolling programme that will deal with all needs. And yes, we have done a survey on all the heating programmes. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. So my final thing is, are you confident that you'll reach this target next year, Council Member? Which target is that? The one relating to CO2. Um, your yeah. Yeah, we, we are completely confident in the in the aspects of the um, parameters that are directly out under our control. Obviously, there are things that aren't under our control. Uh, the weather, for a start. Um, the question of getting on with various contracts to improve the uh, infrastructure. <coughs> but as far as the items that are within our control, we're completely confident that we will be able to meet these targets. Can I also say that, if you read the report, I'm sure you have, you will note that uh, a number of the increases in <coughs> CO2 production are actually so associated with us carrying out more activity than was predicted. So again, we need to uh, look at this report, and there's, it's quite a detailed report about what the CO2 increase was due to, um, we, you know, we need to take all these different factors into account. But in us, the question, yes, we are confident that all the parameters within our control, uh, we are going to be able to deliver this target. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Councillor Leeds. Okay. Um, going back to splash pools. Uh, when you, uh, which look really good by the way, uh, you spoke earlier about the increased usability uh, of the splash pool, so can you explain uh, a bit more detail what that means, please? Right, well that has to do with, um, largely it has to do with the depth of the water. Um, we already have one splash pool in the town, it's in Potter Street, that was an old paddling pool that was moved when um, the play area and the um, paddling pool was redeveloped, and they built a splash pool for us. And I am reliably informed that it's hugely um, popular with the children that work at the co there. Um, because they're shallow, they don't need supervision. And because they don't need supervision, and they use much less water, they simply can just be turned off. The reason why we've had children begging to go into the splash pools, but we haven't been allowed to, to let that happen, is because we have to train the paddling pool attendants, that takes time, we have to recruit them first. And while we've had this gorgeous weather, we've been doing a recruitment and training process ready for the summer holidays. 
the splash pools, it really is a case of turning on a switch, and they work. Um, they have extra modern features that I think children will particularly enjoy, and I, I think the comparison here is the playgrounds of my youth, where you had a, a roundabout, which you then put your finger near the bottom of because it would slice it off, or you had a, a slide which uh, regularly sent somebody off to uh, A&E with a broken arm as you fell over the side. These are safe, but really exciting. Um, and the images, I think, that you should have seen behind me um, attest to that. I was rather amused, actually, in this report, that at some point he calls it a slash pool. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Look, we don't have toilet facilities around our uh, existing paddling pools, and there are accidents that happen. And because of the volume of water in our paddling pools at the moment, it can take two days to drain them and refill them while they're out of action. There's a sh much, much less water in uh, a splash pool, so cleaning them is much more, um, a much quicker process. They're out of action for much less longer. And you have the opportunity to build toilet facilities around these paddling pools as well. And if we're encouraging families to take young children to enjoy the outdoors and the glory of our parks, toilet facilities are necessary. So they are a better facility, they're more hygienic, they're open for longer, and kids can do more. Thank you, Chair. On page 44 of the performance report, my eye is drawn to the refuse and recycling uh, commentary, which says costs associated with the 2018 procurement exercise, 80,000. There, there seems to be a lot of 80,000 thrown around by this council. Oh, no. Now, on that specific cost, we've had a number of portfolio holders time and time again at this cabinet say that the taxpayers will not foot the bill for the failed procurement process. Will there be confirmation at this That's cabinet right. meeting, so, excuse me, let's give us a page, page 44, which I did at the start of, the, of my question, given that the council has previously said that taxpayers will not foot this bill, can you just give me an update on the legal discussions that you're having with the contractors where there was the error with the waste and recycling contract? Where are we with that? Well, are taxpayers not going to be footing this 80,000? The current, si <laughs> the current situation, if you let me answer, is that yeah. yes, there is um, about £80,000, if you're talking about there. That's because we're currently running two cost streams. We've got the cost of the new procurement process, but at the same time, we've got the cost of um, legal advice into recovering the cost from the previous um, procurement process. Yeah. Um, I'm not in a position, I think, to declare where we are in terms of how far we've got with recovering that cost. But that's why we've got uh, 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 an overspend there, um, because we're running two things yeah. side by side. At Which is what I, 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 I asked, Chair. So pass what I just uh, pass illuminate the £80,000. Yes, uh, unfortunately, the way the item is worded, it might be read as to intimate that the £80,000 is an unexpected cost relating to the re-tendering of the contract, which it isn't. It's actually a cost of the original contract, yeah, the tendering process. Uh, it's just that, unfortunately, it wasn't in the budget in the first place, which it should have been, because it was obviously fairly predictable that we were going to tender for. But anyhow, this, um, the money that's shown as an overspend uh, is not an overspend, it's, in the, it's only an overspend in that in a strictly accountancy way, it's the money that was allocated anyway, would have been allocated to fund the original tendering process. Because this is a budget report for last year, and therefore doesn't contain any costs associated with the new process that we've been through, and um, the uh, tenders for the new process uh, have come back and you know, we're now currently evaluating the tenders, the new tenders. As respects uh, of costs, uh, additional costs for re-tendering, I'm not in a position to give any details uh, of that at the moment, but we have promised at previous meetings that we will give a full account of any additional costs uh, 
relating to the retendering of this contract. And we'll so give a full report with all costs, not just picking bits out. We'll give a full account of how much we've it's extra it's costed or maybe it's saved by having to retender. Thank you, Councillor Burton. So, so Chair, no, Chair, I, I, I was asking mind, questions, Chair. Councillor Charles. Excuse thank me, you, I'm you, asking questions on the waste recycling contract. Yes, but I think you'll find that this is my item, so you'll address questions through me. As I am, Chair. And I at the moment, question, I'm Chair. referring to Councillor Burton's answer, which I think is very full, and I think we answered your question. No, if I you have, have a follow-up question. I have a follow-up question, Chair. Follow question, please do. I do have a follow-up question. So the Councillor um, Perton's answer is revealing because it illustrates what I was saying in my original question that the ACK was for the previous procurement. But now we find that you haven't budgeted for it in that financial year. There is also the additional cost of the second procurement process and there is now tonight an unanswered question about whether the taxpayers or the consultants where you made a critical error on the waste contract are going to pay for this. Residents are now in the dark over who is going to pay for that money. It's another 80,000 you're you wasting, Chair. Question, That's the question. Why are you wasting taxpayers' money on simple errors on procurement exercises? This is another 80,000 pounds of taxpayers' money. You didn't budget for it when I mean, you should have. Why so, haven't you done that? So we'll We've got the question. Councillor Perth, would you like to answer? Yes. Well, it, it's totally ridiculous. I can ask the charge to suggest that a retendering process is going to cost the same as the original tender. So if we already had all the tender documents all, all prepared, in fact, we were able to refine them a little bit more, which gave these enabled the tenders to be drawn more tightly. Uh, so I've, sh I've made it clear that I will produce a full plus and minus list of the additional costs or additional savings relating to the retendering. To suggest that's going to be cost of council or the taxpayers who are in the dark, uh, £80,000 is total nonsense. Thank you. Councillor Mullen. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the performance indicators and all of them, all 94 of them, this council hit over 90% of them. Isn't it time we congratulate the staff and officers for the terrific work that they've done by hitting 90% of these performance indicators? And isn't it showing that this administration is actually working very well? Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Stephan. I did thank the officers and I'll thank them again. It's a tremendous performance from um, them and this council to um, achieve such a high percentage of success. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple of questions on uh, page 61 uh, to follow up on the redundancy fund and the transfer of money into that fund. Um, given, given that the uh, perhaps Councillor Danvers can help me as the portfolio holder, given that through you, Chair, um, given that the redundancy fund will stand at £2.3 million after this transfer, how many redundancies on average would that pay for in this council? Depends on the salary of the person who's been made. <laughs> no, it doesn't. If it's on average, you know the answer. Why ask, ask the question? Um, at the end of the day, yeah, we'll, we'll give a written response to you. That's fine. Thank you. Can you confirm, given the two point three million pounds, how many redundancies the council intends to make in the coming years? This administration has made sure that it's made no compulsory redundancies at all, albeit that people who have actually taken early retirement for voluntary redundancy, and we've accepted that as savings. That comes up as the budget comes up and will actually be taken. But the Labour administration, the Labour administration, I believe I speak for my colleagues, this committee, and this <coughs> government once again disrupts local government expenditures so badly. We on this side, unlike what happened previously, we on this side are absolutely committed to no compulsory redundancies. Thank you, Chair. I have one final question on that, if I may. Um, in the last five years, I believe every year, we've approached the Section 151 officer at budget planning around the redundancy fund to um, cease contributions uh, to make budget savings and direct that money into other funds. 
at what point in this year did you receive advice from the Section 1.1 officer that it would be okay to cease those contributions in future? And why has that advice now changed from advice that we were given in the past? If simply because of our record and because of the stability of our finances, partly because of the new contracts that, that we were actually given out, is that we're in a much better financial position. It's taken us a long time to get here, considering what we actually inherited. We were faced with the closure of the Playhouse, the Paddling Halls, Pets Corner, and at the end of the day, we actually had a long battle to actually put our local authority finances back on track. And on top of that, we're continually fighting the Tory government, continually undermining our grant system. We just need to look at the general fund being cut from 15 million to 12 million, just to see the magnitude of the hit that we've actually had to endure while the Tory government's actually been in office. <coughs> so it's, once again, it's a prudent thing that this money's set aside. But if circumstances are changing, and if in the autumn statement, Hammond does actually start to realise the the, the need for local government to actually be respected again, then we can actually start to, to, to loosen the purse strings a bit. But we've got to be very careful because we've got to protect our staff as well. If they're suddenly faced with, with, with so much uncertainty that has been in the past. Thank you. So, let's draw a line under questions. Any statements? Yes. <coughs> Yes, I, I just want to talk about this issue of um, staffing. Uh, first of all, I just want to pick up on a point that Councillor Perry made about the nappy collection, because the fact is the nappy collection hasn't ceased. It's just carried on in another, in another way. Um, so to suggest that the council stopped nappy collection is not true. But anyway, the point I wanted to make, <coughs> um, we've quite rightly praised the staff Tonight, and also the way that the council's uh, finances have been managed over the last uh, number of years. <coughs> and naturally, when we were faced with the enormous cutbacks uh, year after year, we concentrated on frontline services. And this has necessarily meant a reduction in backline staff. Um, you can only do that for so long before it starts to show. And as we move into perhaps a more positive frame of mind, I think we need to uh, recognise that sometimes things we want to achieve, we, we can't keep putting the more and more pressure on the same number of staff. We do need to start thinking about extra staff resources in the back line, particularly in policy work, and developing projects, project management, things that are essential for us to go forward. We need to build up our capacity to plan ahead. Uh, things that, you know, perhaps we find it difficult to ask the staff to do when we know they're completely under pressure at the moment to do the, what, what's, what they've got to do already. So I would just m make that point, not in a negative way, it's in, in actual fact a positive thing. We can start to look forward to that, thing, to, to that positive future. But I, I just wanted to make that point. We shouldn't forget that the staff are, are under terrific pressure. They have delivered, but if we want them to do more, we need to, to look at extra resources. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Charles. Uh, thank you, Chair. So there are some big questions tonight that have been identified as a result of this performance report. When I earlier questioned the leader who then deferred to the portfolio holder about the waste and recycling contracts, yet again we're entering another saga where there are lots of questions about the way this local authority, and particularly the portfolio holder, handles his brief. There are big questions tonight over the cost of the original procurement exercise and the ongoing legal, attractive legal discussions between the consultants that were badly managed under the watch of the portfolio holder and the administration as a whole, leading to the fact that we now have a second procurement process which will incur further costs to the council and to taxpayers. Later on we'll be talking about the procurement strategy and I welcome that and I have questions on that too. 
But there is a clear narrative to this administration which I explored at full council and it relates to this performance report. On basic core issues, there is a lapse of judgment of the portfolio holders. I feel sorry for the officers of this council because the lack of detail, command of detail by portfolio holders has allowed taxpayers' money to be needlessly wasted. And I say to Councillor Harvey, who didn't answer any questions this morning or today, that the procurement process for PR consultants <laughs> has many an answer questions. You've talked, you've talked no specifics about the process. I've issued 14 questions. I look forward to them being answered. But that procurement process and the budget for it has a big red mark around it. And I look forward to the ongoing conversations about that. As for this administration and whole and its performance, the leader of this council at the start, as one of his cue cards said, look at our success. If your success is wasting thousands, tens upon thousands of taxpayers' money on vanity projects and a second waste and re recycling contract, then I don't think that's a success at all. Thank you, Chair. Can I also put on record, as I did at um, annual, uh, last full council, my thanks to the officers. I, I think there's a, a lot of good work that's contained within this report. Um, to address your comments, um, Chair, on the paddling pools or on splash parks, um, the, the idea of which is absolutely fine. I was a big supporter of the splash park in Potter Street, and I've seen the difference that it's made down there. Um, obviously, we'll want to see the details, but I, I think you know we do need to modernise, we do need to grow, and I don't have any issue with that, and you, you have my support there. Can I mention two things about paddling pools and splash parks, though? The first is a number of the, the current paddling pools were placed in areas that had not been excavated, uh, had not been dug, um, and as we proved when we put the Potter Street splash park in, there were Roman remains, as there is so many archaeological remains around this town. Can we take that into account and make sure that in any plans we build in time just in case we find something? I'd hate to be looking at next summer ready to open splash parks um, <laughs> and then them not be able to make be open because we found some interesting archaeological discovery beneath them. And secondly, uh, Chair, I, I remember one of the frustrations when I was leader um, with the paddling pools um, was the vandalism by certain rogue elements within this town. Um, where if you've got a broken bottle lobbed into the middle of the paddling pool, you would have to drain, which indeed, as you say, can take up to two days, drain the paddling pool um, to clear the glass and refill it. Um, can I perhaps join with you together in front of the media to call on people to respect our paddling pools and not to do that this year, not to spoil children's fun? Uh, you know, I think there are many things we can disagree on in this chamber, but I think the health and safety of our children is, is one that we'll never, never disagree on. Um, a comment on the, and I don't want to belabour the point that Councillor Charles was making about procurement exercises, but I will just say one thing. It was enlightening when Councillor Harvey said as part of the, the, the answer earlier on that she had a pro, they had the council, well, not, not you, apologies, it wasn't you, uh, that the council had approached five companies. And I always feel the best practice in um, tendering is to publish a tender Indeed. and to ask for responses. It seems strange to me that we approached specific companies and I perhaps um, hope that some of the answers to Councillor Charles's written questions will cover those details. And I wonder how many times we do that in procurement exercises in this council. That's a level of concern for me. Um, and just a, a comment, Chair, which I have made before at Cabinet um, about the um, complaints graph. We will always have complaints in the council. And I, I know um, a, a slight upward trend developing over the last four months. I often think rather than having a, um, it's on page six of the main, oh, sorry, page eight of the main report, I rather think rather than just having an extensive one line trend, something like an SPC chart, a statistical process control chart for a multi point graph is far more interesting and useful um, because things like five, tre five items trending in the same direction will give will it will give an indicator that will suggest there is a problem or an issue that needs to be dealt with and i think it's great that we've got this level of intelligence in the report but perhaps it's now starting to be time to refine that and to look at how we can better use that intelligence to flag problems coming um, so those are my comments chair so thank you very much thank you
It's interesting, Chair, that the opposition are coming round to criticising uh, contract procedures. Um, Margaret Thatcher forced the <laughs> railway <laughs> and the whole idea of privatisation now is going, excuse the pun, off the rails. We've seen that the railways, we've been made to actually over the years, we've been made to actually have these, these contracts. We used to run all these services in-house. Very successful, very successful indeed. Now we see things like Great Lean in charge of railways failing. Great Lean, who was in charge of the probation service, making the probation service going out. And now the absolute disgrace of which the, the, the way in which both those contracts have been managed. And Essex County Council, Virgin, <coughs> taking over children's services with no responsibility whatsoever. So it is interesting that the, the Tory opposition now are actually increasingly questioning the whole idea of the contract process and how expensive uh, it is. Yes, it is very expensive, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, and completely unnecessary if we could actually pull quite a lot of these services back in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, my comments are, and I would actually start by agreeing with some of the comments that Councillor Andrew Johnson made. I think health and safety of children should be paid event to have all 33 cancers in this chamber. Um, I'd also agree with some of the comments you made about complaints, and I'm actually, in my responsibility in housing, actually actively talking at the moment with senior officers and HTS officers about how we monitor complaints. Because what, when I delved into it, when members of the public sometimes find and they sometimes find them clarification issues, it's locked as a complaint. Now, is that really a complaint? I think we need to put on that out. So I, think, I do welcome the comments that we need to have more information about complaints and the type of complaint again. We're, always, we're never going to stop getting complaints, but I think we can not just give a broad part figure at the end of the day that doesn't really, I think, give us the right information. But the main uh, reason I wanted to speak was getting back to the splash parks. As a rural councillor, in Harlem Common, had to be only splash park uh, in the town. I, I know how extremely successful it is. And it's not just residents and children in Harlem Common that use that facility. Children come from all over this town. And I think possibly a bit further to use the splash park. I, I think it's a real kind shame in the last four or five weeks we've had some splendid weather here, cricket weather as I call it, and we can't get children to enjoy it. Um, how we we'll have to go to Potter Street, we could have this kind of facility all across the town. I remember going back to the decision to have that splash park in Highland Common. It was part of the GAF2 project um, that we took on many, many years ago. And it was all um, help Harlow Renaissance helped us deliver that project. And what was really interesting is Harlow Renaissance, along with council officers, actually approached Potter Street Junior and Infant School to speak to the children. Actually, and they were given the choice. They were given the choice of moving the padding pool as it was over to the Larkswood Field, or do you want this new type of splash park? The children overwhelmingly supported that they wanted this splash park. It was exciting for them, better for them, and I think it just gives them more entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I welcome the fact that we're going to board that across the whole town. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, popular and people, children who want to go, so their parents have to go out there, get up a picnic, socialise with other other parents, and make friends. So well done. Right, over to me then. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome the constructive comments of Councillor Johnson. I'll say that with a microphone on. Mm -hmm. I'd welcome the constructive comments of uh, Councillor Johnson, and um, I fully support his call for um, everybody to respect the facilities that we've got in this town for the enjoyment of our children. Um, broken bottles in the paddling pools or the splash pools, you know, it's a horrendous thing to do. Please don't do it. Um, I was going to say, so, very positive, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Looking back at the uh, overall comments from the other side, though, um, only the most curmudgeonly and embittered naysayers would have done anything other than welcome this report and the excellent news in it. So thank you very much, um, Councillor Charles, for not disappointing me. Um, yet again, certain elements of the Tories have tried their best to put Harlow down. They don't give credit where it's due. And if Labour's record doesn't supply them with things to criticise, they go to their imagination for big red marks. 
So let's look at a few facts. It's because you're so predictable. Whilst the Tory government breaking the manifesto promise, add to insecurity while cutting frontline police officer numbers by 400 in Essex, giving rise to a tweet from a serving officer recently, saying he was the only uniformed officer on duty for the whole of Harlow that night. Harlow Labour employed extra community safety officers, detailed in this report. Harlow Labour invest in community assets, detailed in this report, that bring people together. The Tories in Westminster cut investment in communities, such that hate crime is on the increase to the point that where today we heard that police are responding to less than a third of incidents. The Tories cut services, we invest in services. The Tories' housing policies have doubled homelessness since 2010, but our report shows how Harlow Labour works tirelessly to limit the damage. This year, Essex County Council increased its Band D council tax on Harlow residents by a maximum £58 per year. The Essex Tory Police and Crime Commissioner increased his precept by £12 a year for Band D residents. Harlow Council froze council tax, adding absolutely nothing, not a penny, to a Band D council taxpayer. And how did we do it? Well, while Tory councils across the country make draconian cuts, and others face bankruptcy as they outsource services to rapacious companies more interested in paying dividends to shareholders than providing services. This Labour Council have brought privatised services back from profit-making company to HTS, a Harlow Council-owned company that invests profits in this town, resulting in a half a million pound dividend for Harlow residents, a dividend that will continue to pay out year after year after year. And let's remember, the Tories opposite opposed us every single step of the way. If we'd listened to them, there would be no more paddling pools in a few short, few short years, let alone the improved facilities we deliver. What do Harlow residents want? Good services. I can do I like. This report shows we are providing good and improving services. What do Harlow residents want? Sound finances. This report shows we are delivering sound finances. What do Harlow residents want? The security that comes from an inclusive community, an imaginative, confident planning for the future of the town. Harlow residents want success. And this Labour administration, as shown in this report, is delivering success. Thank you. Right, let's move on to... Pardon? Oh, no, we haven't made a decision yet. So, <laughs> after all that, we've made a decision. So, um, we're voting on recommendation A, B and C on pages 27 and 28. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Now, let's move on to item 11, the Housing Revenue Account Report, pages 62 to 73. Um, who's moving that motion? I move that, Chair. Second, Chair. Thank you. Control here in regards to the housing revenue account is an underspend of uh, 679,000. Taking into account the adjustments to the housing and capital programme, the consequential impact on the revenue account is uh, nearly 4 uh, million. Um, part of this really is because of the, the capital uh, programme, which actually displays uh, a lot of this. If people actually want the complete details, they're actually set out on pages 71 to 73, Chair. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor mm -hmm. Johnson. Thank you. Does the portfolio holder view an underspend in the housing revenue account as a failure to our tenants, given that this is rent money that is meant to be spent on working for our tenants? I'm happy to answer that. Um, I think, no, because in this time of uncertainty, and you'll see further in the poll, um, bullet point 15, about some of the risks that we are taking, um, that we've had to come through, particularly around extra money we've had to find for homelessness. We don't know what's going to happen with the Greenfield uh, inquiry and how much money that's going to cost us. And 
We've also got a lot of uncertainty about things like universal credit, and we're not too sure about how that's going to affect the amount of rent that we're going to collect. When you add all that in the pot, we have to be very prudent with these assumptions at the end of the day. So no, I do not believe that is a failure. Could I follow up with one, one more question, please, Chair? In which case, could Councillor Wilkinson tell us why we haven't in the past built a contingency into the housing revenue account if there are so many uncertainties that need to be taken account of? I think, I think the answer to that is we do build a contingency. We build a contingency every single year because we have to look at the risks going forward and we have to try and make assumptions going forward. Sometimes those assumptions become prudent during that year and sometimes they do not. So I think the answer to that question is we, do, we build a contingency a constituent big plan every single year. Thank you. I think uh, Councillor Bamford is about to Could I also add, Chair, up until 2015, until once again Osborne's budget, we did have that. We actually built in the contingency. We actually had uh, aims over quite a long period of time. Suddenly, why do we We actually had a rent decrease imposed upon us for four years running. It suddenly took the rug away from under our feet in terms of being able to actually make those kinds of decisions. We still actually have council house sales still running on. Um, the, the, the Tory government have allowed this to happen and, and have actually encouraged this to happen. And our local MP even actually advertises it to actually encourage people to, to buy. And that money is actually lost to this authority. In fact, we underestimated how much that, that would be. Continually, the vagaries of the Tory government make local government very, very uncertain. And once the Tory government actually appreciates how important it is to give stability to local authorities, then it'd be much easier for us to actually plan ahead. Thank you. Any further questions? Statements? Thank you. I, I, I was going to. Um, keep my comments for the capital programme but I, I will step in here um, I, I think it's absolutely wonderful that Council Danvers keeps on keeps on going back 28, 30 years uh, to uh, whoever was in government then to uh, blame the, uh, the, the the problems of, to, uh, of today um, and he's expressing concern about the impact of universal credit um, he'll see in the HRA report I don't have the figure in front of me um, but there was a provision, a bad debt provision of £300,000 in last year's HRA for bad debts, uh, and in fact only £83,000 was required. Uh, rent collection is running at around 99%. Um, so a lot of, um, a sort of national waving of teeth about uh, the impact of welfare reform does seem to be uh, uh, un unrequired, uh, and certainly. Uh, council staff are, are doing their very best in, in, in achieving these. Um, the, the comment I was going to make is that this report did actually come to uh, the Senate board last week um, and I commented afterwards it was incredibly badly written and I'm glad to see that um, it has been edited. It was much easier to read this week. Any other statements? Right, so we are now voting on recommendations A, B, C and D on pages 62 and 63. All in favour? Very, very good. Thank you. So now let's turn to the Capital Programmes Outturn Report, pages 74 to 86. So moved, Chair. And our second chair. Thank you. No, I don't I think you're going to have to take comments or questions, Chair. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, <coughs> um, notes of these questions were provided last week at the uh, Housing Standards Board. Um, page 77, paragraph 6B, uh, about the uh, new heating system going into Taney's Dell. Um, the overall cost overran by £184,000 or about 25%. Now, I very much appreciate it's a pilot, pilot project, um, but the, the fundamental reason it, it overran, as I understand it, uh, is that whilst they're having to replace the 50-year-old heating system in the flats, nobody bothered about the 50-year-old ducting underground, which actually conveyed the hot water. 
uh, and I was wondering what steps have been taken to uh, analyse how that happened, why it was overlooked, uh, and what steps are going to be taken in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Carr is quite correct in his statement. This was the oh. first of many, it was the pilot scheme. And from, like all pilots, pilot sealant, you learn lessons from pilots and make sure things don't happen again. When I questioned officers about this overspend, it was because of we replaced, as Councillor Carr has said, all the pipe work all the ducts and above ground and had no way of knowing that underneath the ground the pipes were in poor condition which caused us a problem halfway through the project. What we are now doing moving forward with all the other projects is making sure this will never happen again and that we are replacing all the pipes under the thing. It was a, it was a learning curve from us because it, the first projects of quite a multi-million pound project where we're going to save tenants lots of money for having more efficient heating systems within the housing. And that is the reason that one uh, overspent, on, which is what but we will deliver on target on, on a five year, very ambitious programme. Thank you. <coughs> Chair, if I may, I, I, I do have a second question. This is on page 78, paragraph 10. Um, we're talking about the funding for the housing capital programme, and it says, Additional receipts received from the sale of non-right-to-buy properties resulted in an additional 1.5 million being held as capital receipts as of the 31st of March. Now, uh, I have received a reply, a very detailed reply, um, but there seems to be a mismatch between the answer uh, and the words, because in the very thorough answer there is still no reference to any non-housing uh, non so the sale of non-housing assets in the one and a half million pounds. Now, uh, we've been spending a lot of time tonight in the last few days worrying about £84,000, £83,000. We seem to have a stray £1.5 million pounds suddenly turning up. Um, and it seems to be unclear um, as to the source of that funding. Uh, if it is according to the answer that I was provided with uh, last week, then the wording in the report is wrong. Um, and I wonder if somebody will care to comment on that. Um, I don't know the uh, detailed answer, Councillor Carter, um, but non right to buy housing receipts relates to those like sheltered housing schemes that we don't sell, or also those properties that we should be able to dispose of as part of our housing capital disposal. So I'm happy to provide a detailed answer and match the cross reference against the but it wasn't in the answer you gave me last week. We'll have to provide that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. A uh, question on paragraph 6, uh, 6D, uh, disabled adaptations. Um, I note that we um, are carry, proposing to carry over £179,000 of disabled adaptation works to be completed in <coughs> the next financial year. Can I be assured that no one that was waiting for the disabled adaptation works has waited longer than planned because of that carryover? Thank you, Joe. I'm not aware that the carryover um, is resulting in any of the um, individual cases. Those individual cases uh, have a uh, fairly protected uh, history involving assessment by the facial therapist recommendation of works, um, seeking detailed specification and then uh, plans to conclude the works and the case started in the previous year in the intention is to carry over funding that was allocated to that the next year so I'm not aware of any cases that have um, waited unduly long. It is a long process that's it. Um, as, a, as a follow up then Chair, is there anything that we can do, given it's a long and protracted process, and I remember uh, being involved in a few cases before, is there anything else we can do to speed that process up? Thank you, Chair. Well, um, the environmental health team have been working with the housing management team, in fact, to do exactly that, to try to streamline the process in the case of council tenants and to um, align the process of adaptation with the process of considerations of other things that might need, uh, meet needs. So the, the 
intention is the recommendation goes directly to the housing team and if an adaptation is required it can be managed from there and that frees the uh, tenants at least from the burden of uh, completing a lot of paperwork and so forth. Any statements? Okay. Sorry. Apologies. Um, can I just um, highlight paragraph 26, um, which of course, of course talks about the impact that the um, Grenfell public inquiry was at. Now, obviously, we've debated in this chamber before and mentioned the fact that obviously Harlow has a very good record under multiple different administrations of different colours, um, its approach to um, fire safety in our blocks. And, um, you know, um, we were very fortunate that we were held up as a public example nationally on this. Can I just say, the opposition recognises the far-reaching consequences of that inquiry. Um, we take very seriously the potential requirement that's noted here to totally recast the Housing Capital Works programme. Um, and you will have our complete support on that because I think it's important that when the, that inquiry finally reports and there are potential changes that we need to make here, in fact, I know we will be supporting some of the changes that we'll preemptively be making in this council. Um, I just wanted to put on record that you will have our support on that and, and there no, should be no issue from us on that. Thank you. Okay. Any other statements? So we're now voting on recommendation A to E on pages 74 and 75 of the agenda, all agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on then to um, the procurement strategy, I think. It is the other one. On pages 89 to pages 107. Um, who's proposing them? Okay. Okay. Um, so we're pleased to bring this procurement strategy. It sets out a high level approach of the council in seeking lawful, ethical, value for money goods and services to support the council's aims. It's not an operational procedure manual of how the strategy will be implemented in any individual cases. It is a strategic document which has been updated to reflect changes in legislation and restate the Council's commitment to eliminating unlawful discriminatory practices. It will help secure competitively priced contracts that is, that is important as we are committed to spending money wisely and for the benefit of Harlow, but it has a wide impact on simply finance. It gives local businesses a fair chance, ensures that those we contract with are compliant with the new data protection requirements and the protections against modern slavery. These areas must be as important to our suppliers as they are to us as a council. It embeds equality and diversity <coughs> principles within contracts, allowing those who meet the agreed financial and competency checks to participate in the procurement process. Sitting behind this document are guidance, as well as the governance structures detailed in the Council's contract standing orders that you can find on part four, page 116146 of the Constitution. The advice of the legal procurement team, supplemented by specialist external advice as appropriate, the monitoring reports of our senior management board to raise awareness amongst staff. So third tier managers are briefed by regular meetings and guidance <coughs> documents are sent to them so they can dis disseminate the information to their teams. An article in the weekly information sheet, Procurement News, has been published and some more are planned. And then there's the website and the internet pages. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, can I welcome this report? Um, it's one of your first ever substantive reports, and I welcome it. Um, I just have a couple of questions. 
um, I've taken an interest in the procurement process of the council, as you can understand. <laughs> um, on page 97, it talks about in section B, advertising. And it says, public procurement regulations place a duty on officers to publicise the council's requirements, etc. Given the answer that Councillor Harvey made, that they invited rather than publicised the PR consultant's work, um, why wasn't the duty specified here to publicise a procurement followed? Two questions. What I think is helpful in this report is the framework chart on page, it's not got a number, but I think it's 104. It's got 13, but I think it's 104. Um, the two specific areas that are of interest to me in this framework are stage one and stage two, which I think are core to the planning process of any procurement activity of the council. Corporate planning, identify needs and options, appraisal. What I don't see in here, and do correct me if I'm wrong, is a specific mention, and there's some gaps right at the corporate planning stage, for value for money tests, which have failed under the PR consultants, and then some specific additional compliances that we would place as a council on consultants. I think that's really important to be factored into the planning stages whenever you approach a procurement process, given the learning lessons that we're trying to achieve from the waste and recycling contract. Just want your thoughts on that. Well, firstly, um, I'm not going to comment on the waste, of, uh, the waste of contract, um, per se. Um, so, yeah, I, I, sorry, can you just repeat the first part of your question? I think I've got the second part, the first part. We factor in stage one and stage two, value for money tests, and com additional compliance for consultants. It is actually there anyway. That is that, that that is what that's saying to us. I mean, and it's you know obviously something that that we will be doing. So a spend analysis. Yes. Um, so I, I noted the spend analysis. Don't get me wrong. What I'm referring to is an explicit mention in the corporate planning stage of benchmarking and value for money. Um, analysis. Spend analysis, fair enough, but I, want ex I, I would have thought, given the experiences that we've had over two procurement processes, that that should be explicit, as well as com additional compliances for consultants. That's all I'm saying. But I see where you are. Okay, I'll take that one. Thank you. Thanks. That's it. Any other questions? Statements? Oh, yeah. I didn't think I forgot to say. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Sri Chairman, if I can ask uh, portfolio holder, uh, in paragraph 5 of the report, um, it states the use of contract binders, uh, the council's procurement portal, and other ways in which opportunities are published. Um, could you expand on the portal? Is this the SXY portal? Do we have our own portal? And um, what are the other ways? Please. And also, we would advertise in other places, such as newspapers, or you know, if we wanted a specialist service, then the specialist publications. Okay, so, you're, so we, we have our own portal controlled by us as well as using the SSY. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good if I may share one other question. Um, in um, paragraph uh, six of the report, uh, 
bear with me, Chair. Um, that's on page uh, 90. Um, it states, sorry, I'm just flipping between. Yeah. No, no. no. Um, it states that the council standard terms and conditions continue to include the council's aspirations to prevent discriminatory practices. Then if we look at page 10 of the strategy, which is 101, um, it states, zero hours contracts. The council will refuse, to the extent the law allows, the appointment of contractors who make use of zero hours contracts. Now, I have a concern. The, the, the policy to refuse contractors who use ZHC is in itself a discriminatory practice. Um, I would suggest it's also a restraint of trade. Um, the policy itself, it, it, uh, the policy is not a reasonable res uh, restriction. I'm concerned the council could be open to challenge through the courts by any company that falls foul of this pointless policy, uh, and they will win that challenge easily. Um, the whole paragraph, I believe, should be should be removed. Uh, and, and my question is. Um, Will you please look at this and look to remove this policy uh, for the very simple reason that there is nothing under law and you state to the extent of the law that says that um, uh, uh, that, that it, is, it, it is an illegal practice. I mean, the, the companies uh, and the workers um, are under a le it's a legal employment practice and it's, it's supported by the majority of workers because it actually gives them greater flexibility. Thank you. Um, I am astonished that you think yeah. um, secure employment is pointless. <laughs> I will pass it over to um, try not to take that too much to uh, Councillor Shears. They love it. Oh. You're astonishing. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll certainly um, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise, I'll attempt to be quicker in future, Chair. Um, I wasn't going to, but I will just come back on the point that's been made there about zero hour contract. And I know this is a political football that is used nationally. Um, I did some research earlier today when Councillor Churchill raised his question with me. And I got a very interesting report from the Office of National Statistics published just a couple of months ago. And it said that of the paid people in this country on zero hours contracts, 2.8% of the workforce are on zero hours contracts. It said that the average um, hours worked, the average hours worked by paid people on zero hour contracts were 25.2 hours per week. And that the proportion of people who wanted in more hours than they were currently working on zero hour contracts was 25% of the 2.8, that's 0.7% of the workforce. Now, at a time when we've got highest rates of employment in history under this government, I know this uh, Labour Party in this town has talked about, oh yeah, but loads of those are zero hours contract jobs. The facts by the Office of National Tati Statistics say that that is not the case. The Office for National Statistics in this report from earlier this year also stated that in their research they had found that the majority of people on zero hours contracts were young people, particularly young mothers and students, who in their research they found wanted to be on those contracts to earn some extra money at times that were convenient to them. Mm. I have to say, I think the ideology of the left in this council mm. is wrong on this. I think that zero hours contract can be useful tools in helping employment and I think the ideological objectives, uh, ob objections that you have are getting in the way here and I do agree with Councillor Churchill on this that I think this is an unnecessary step to take. I accept that there are some rogue employers out there and there are some people who have abused zero hours contracts and I think they need to be whipped into line yeah. but I do think this is an overreaction uh, and Chair, I've tried to be as constructive as, as I can tonight. I am still trying to be constructive here, although I recognise I'm going to get probably shouted at for it. But I think this is a step too far by this council, and I would caution you against it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
All I say, Chair, is that I think Conservatives misunderstand which side the flexibility is on. The flexible part of zero hours contracts is so that employers can call in people or not call them in to suit the employer. The idea that zero hours contracts offer employees a flexible way of working is a junk. So I think it's quite right that we should ensure that we don't participate in the discriminatory practices of zero hour contracts in, in securing products for our country. Councillor Chair, I won't say too much on this point other than to say I think we're a million miles away from the point Councillor Church was making, which is often the case here, but let's bring it back to the point. <laughs> we're not debating whether um, zero hour contracts are legal or not legal. The fact is they are legal, and what Councillor Church was trying to point out to you was the fact that they are legal and yet you are discriminating against employers that use them could leave you open to legal challenge. Yeah. It's a simple, straight matter. So until zero hour contracts are ruled illegal, for whatever reason that may be, they do still exist. And therefore, if you do not take on board that suggestion seriously, you could leave yourself open to challenge. And that was the point he was trying to make. And to be fair, the way that it was laughed away suggests the attitude generally about procurement that we've seen in the past. So I really do think you should take the point seriously. Whether they're good or they're bad, zero hour contracts is neither here nor there. The fact is they are legal. It's raised a re relevant point that I think you should take on board. Thank you, Councillor. Very briefly, Chair. Legal challenge in terms of Uber um, are being upheld in the courts at the moment. Legal challenges with the, I forgot what the plumber's name was in the uh, plumber's, wasn't it? Um, completely, the, the courts completely. Are we going to take the risk of actually treating people so badly? People need pensions, people need security, people need to know where their, their money is coming from. And I don't know where Councillor Johnson gets his figures from, but all I know is actually you start talking, you start talking to people, you start talking to care workers, and you start talking to care workers on zero hours contracts and find out the dreadful conditions that they operate in. They might be 2.8% of the working population to Councillor Johnson, but they are very real people in certain degrees of distress. And I would encourage you to actually volunteer to go on the welfare pattern chair to actually see some of the distress that things like universal credit is leading people into uh, zero hours contract jobs. We only had the case at the beginning of the year uh, where, where the lady appeared before us. So in terms of heart-wrenching circumstances, don't go by 2.8% of some mythical figure. Talk to people and see how badly people are actually treated by zero-hours contracts. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to draw up for me to talk. Thank you. We are not here to talk about zero-hours contracts. The councillor, um, councillor Shears has said she will take away. Councillor Shears has said she will take away councillor um, Hardwick's consider concerns for consideration. Now, can we move on? Are there any other statements? It is on the agenda, though, isn't it, councillor? It's on this agenda. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just. Oh, just yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Can I have the same level? I keep quiet when you're speaking. Can you point of order? We're going to move on. We're moving on, Councillor Strachan. Sorry, it's my error. I spoke too soon. Councillors, we're voting on recommendations A and B on page 18. All in favour? Thank you. So now we move on to the communal heating programme. Pages 108 to 111. I formally move this chair out. Thank you. Second. Councillor Wilkinson, do you want to talk now? No, happy to take any questions or and comments at the end, Chair. Councillor Tom? Questions? Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, closing statements then. Statements? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I, I wasn't expecting questions apart from the usual one about can we guarantee the right doing this work. 
uh, during the winter months, so I'm surprised I didn't get that tonight, so thank you very much. But <laughs> getting, back, <laughs> getting back to more um, serious matters, so this is quite an important piece of work for this council. Um, it's regularly raised not only in this chamber, it's also regularly raised at the House and Standards Board, and we get lots of questions from these holders and tenants about this. And I think we need to be remind ourselves sometimes of why we're doing this. And if you look in recommendation C, it's actually about the council's commitment to energy efficiency and tackling the fuel poverty, um, which is a very, very big issue for a lot of people in this town, tackling the fuel poverty. So I welcome every single stage when we do more and more of these replacement schemes. It's, as I said earlier, it's a five-year rolling scheme and we're now going into the second uh, phase of that. And I look forward to um, many of these schemes being finished as soon as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. we're now um, voting on recommendation A, isn't it? On page 108. All those in favour? Thank you. And we move on to item 15, the public space protection order consultation on pages 112 to 151. Moved by Councillor Harvey. I second. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Happy to take questions. Councillor Carson. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> um, this is all very much uh, mother and apple pie. Um, it, 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 it's you know, very welcome. Um, hopefully, it can be made to work properly. Uh, if it's adequately resourced, uh, which is the sort of main concern and not really addressed, or at least I wasn't able to discern from the report what resources were going into it. Um, just sort of a couple of detailed questions. Um, obviously, one of the big issues is cycling in the town centre, which is an absolute pain in the backside and everywhere, and everywhere else. But what steps would the council be taking to provide more parking for, sort of, for bicycles? Um, I noticed uh, earlier on today that Councillor Wilkinson had to park his bike outside the leisure centre because we don't have any outside the... What did you call that CCTV, the others have it. Oh yeah, okay. They've already had a bike So, you know, that's what sums up here. You know, what steps are we going to take to ensure that cyclists do have somewhere to put their bikes when they go shopping? Uh, I think the first point you made your question you raised was around resourcing. So just to address that, we have three PCSOs uh, working in the shopping areas, and this is a specific resource for them to use in their work, as I understand it. Uh, so that is the resource behind the uh, order, assuming the consultation goes through and goes well. Um, in terms of um, bike racks, I can't talk about the town centre, but I can certainly talk about my board, where I know for a fact that we are going to have more bike racks um, which is important because it's going to be one of the wards that we hope that we can run this um, order through. But Councillor Strachan, you might have something to add to that. Just to inform that there will be in the consultation as well, but there is a rolling program of new bike racks being installed around the town centre. So there will be a lot of new bike in safe, secure areas. Uh, all that infrastructure is in place and the money's been allocated and the first one's already been put in place. So the first one will be in post office walk uh, and there will be others put around the town centre over the next year. Mm -hmm. Richard, if I may have, I have another question or comment. I, um, one of the, also on page 115, paragraph 21C, uh, could be a, a ban on ball games. Um, which does seem to be a bit of a pity as we just erected uh, a number of table tennis tables in the market square. So uh, <coughs> I'm wondering which hand is going to be working there and whether you know, that left hand know what the right hand is doing. No, I'll just ask that. Actually, you might as well read it, Simon. It actually says throwing, kicking, catching, running with ball or any other object. It doesn't say anything about batting them. So <laughs> 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 you, you seen me play <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Any statements? Oh. Yeah. As ward councillor for the area, the top of the carriage. So the 
ward councillor for the Tobruk area, can I sort of welcome this? It's certainly not before time, and I hope that the public consultation, when it goes out and comes back, is fully supportive of this. Um, can I also point out, though, that we've got other significant issues within the town with regard to wider crime and the need for enhanced police activity. In May, I, I went on the Police UK website uh, today, and in May 2017, there were 136 reported crimes in the town centre area. In May 2018, there were 192 reported <coughs> crimes within this area, and that's just reported, so it's something like a 14% increase. We also know that over the last, what, three months, certainly March onwards, March, April onwards, there's been significant problems around the Adams House area. Significant in terms of we've had uh, businesses down there feeling intimidated, we've had businesses witnessing at times violent behaviour. We've had, uh, we know that some of that behaviour is probably drug related. I've spoken to uh, Marissa uh, in terms of the activity, the activity that, the, uh, the, the, that her team are doing. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and she's informed me about how they've been monitoring the situation and seeking to address the situation. She's also informed me how they've, they've very much encouraged uh, businesses, etc., to be making certain that they're reporting these incidents and the incidents are uh, going through. I also spoke um, yesterday to uh, Tony Walker, um, and the, who's a uh, police inspector, about the issues. Um, from, because from my conversation as far as Marissa is concerned, what she was saying in terms of monitoring stuff, a lot of that has now been done, they know who the people are, they know what they, and they've done a whole lot of work behind that. Um, the question now is about disrupting the behaviour and making certain it doesn't happen. In order to do that, there is going to be a need for increased police activity within the town. And I know, and now I'm going to speak on a cross-party basis because I know that Robert Halfon is, is called for increased police activity within the town. You did that in your Harlow earlier on. Um, certainly we as a party, the Labour Party, have been called, we've called for increased police activity within the town. And my hope is that we can now, as a uh, united, you know, in a united way, go back to the go call for increased um, visible police activity within the town centre to actually address these specific issues. Because my fear is, we've now got the school holidays that, are, that you know, start this week, as it were. We've had this, all this sort of behaviour that's been going on for some, you know, for quite some months now, and now's the time to address it. And the only way we're going to be able to address it, and from talking to Marissa and, to talk, and also from talking my, from my conversation with the police inspector, the only way we're going to be able to address it is with increased police visibility. Whether that's in a short-term programme or whatever, but we need it and we need it now. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor. Uh, first of all, can I welcome this report and the powers for creating public space protection orders? Yeah, I, I agree with Tony. I think this court's cross-party support there are just a couple of comments I have, though, over the way forward and how we take these, uh, this the piece of legislation and then the, spe the specific order that the Act allows to do this kind of work. Clearly, there, every councillor um, here tonight could talk about pockets of issues around antisocial behaviour in their wards, and that's just a sad reality of life. One of the things I think police and as communicators community leaders we need, we need to work on as this comes into force, is making sure isolated issues that happen in the town centre then don't disperse into other communities in the town. And that's at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, and that would be something that we're watching both for community leaders and of course the police constables that operate in the town. There are specific issues in Old Harlow and we're working successfully, I have to say, with the officers, the community safety team, um, and some um, other people that are involved in crime fighting agencies in the town. Um, I think we're very lucky with the sort of dynamic police officers that we do have in this town who are very willing and able to work with community leaders to try and resolve these issues. 
I have to say, the police still attend community meetings in Old Harlow to talk to local residents, um, and that's a success story for the town on how community policing should be done. But we should also recognise that the Police and Crime Commissioner is recruiting full-time police officers. And actually, Harlow, when you look at the figures, is benefiting from um, that recruitment. We're getting full-time police constables coming to the town as a result of that opening of recruitment. And that's a good thing. But clearly, as this dispersal order is put into force, along with the consultation, and we iron out some of these issues, I very much hope that we focus on making sure that pockets of issues then don't disperse and go to other areas in the town. Thank you, Jay. You see, I wasn't quick enough. Um, I, I, I totally welcome the report as, um, as Councillor Charles, and I'm sure every councillor around the table. I share Joel's concern about you know not pushing um, antisocial behaviour from one part of the town to the other, and I look forward to how we could potentially roll this out uh, across the town. We, we were here using this act a couple of years ago um, with conversations with the police, but they wanted to take a much more draconian stance and not work with us. They wanted to just do what the police wanted to do, and it's good to see now that this is coming forward. Uh, and works really well. And uh, obviously, I've put on record my thanks. There's a, the contributing officer on this, Marisha. Um, her team is absolutely incredible. And I, I, I think, you know, any councillors that haven't spent some time out on the street with them, please do. Um, you know, uh, last time it was a number of years ago, but I think under over the years, uh, Marisha's team, for quite a small team, punches well above its weight and is held up as an example of the way they work with the police across both Essex and Hertfordshire. Uh, and I think we, we owe them a debt of thanks. I'd like to welcome um, Councillor Edwards' um, uh, contribution. Uh, I know politically we don't see eye to eye on many things, and I know you know we could widen out the police debate into a lot of other areas that I don't really want to go into. If there is anything I can do to support you in the suggestion of getting those those police officers out of the station and onto the into the town centre, I'm quite happy to stand with you and do that. Um, and I'm just reminded, Chair, I want to tell you on Friday I was talking to um, an ex. Chief Superintendent of the Met um, is a, a councillor in, um, in um, Sheary, yeah, in fact. Sure. And uh, I was talking to him about policing, and he was saying, actually, Essex police really need to modernise. Um, and I said, well, how do you mean? And he said, well, did you realise that in some places around the country, when you phone up and say, oh, a plant pot's been nicked from outside my house, and Essex Police at the moment say, OK, well, we'll come and take a statement from you on Wednesday afternoon. And then they phone up on Wednesday afternoon and say, sorry, we, we can't make it. We'll come next Thursday afternoon. And then they say, actually, we'll be there next Friday. And at the end of the day, they take a statement and say, you know, I had a plant pot that was put, stolen from outside of my house. I didn't give anyone permission to take the plant pot. The plant pot looked like this, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they take that statement. All of that is actually really unnecessary. They know at the very beginning they're not going to catch whoever nicked that thing. They know that you want a crime reference number for your insurance company, and actually there's an awful deal, a great deal of police time wasted in doing those things, and a number of forces up and down the country have actually dispensed with some of that and said, actually, we'll be up front, we're not going to catch the little scrope that's done that, uh, and we're going to give you your crime number, and we're just going to close that case there. Because what we're going to do is spend our time out in the hotspots, like Councillor was talking about, patrolling those areas, giving a visible presence, and spending the time that we do have actually making an impact. And I think you know, anything we can do as a council to persuade Essex Police to, to modernise in that way and make best use of the resources they've got, whatever we all feel about the resources, I think would be most welcome. I can come back very briefly. I mean, I, the issue for me that here and now is visible policing. It's quite simple. And uh, one can get into a whole debate if we're not careful about the way the efficiency or the way that the Essex police are working or not working and whether the funding, etc., is not working. In terms of the discussions that I've already had, that we've, I've been told that additional police will be coming in January, which is welcomed. On the other hand, we have a problem in the town centre now. If that needs to be, and if they need to get additional policing from across Essex into our town centre to address it, then that's what needs to be done. And that's what I would be hoping that we can say, okay, never mind the debate about, you know, the efficient ways of working, etc., because that's a much larger debate. 
in terms of the resources that need to be poured into the town centre now to address the issues, this is a serious problem and it needs to be addressed seriously by the police and if we can do anything collectively to do that, I, I would certainly welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. There's no other statement. I'll sum up it briefly. Um, I want to uh, share my uh, admiration for Marissa's team. I've been down there. They are truly fantastic. I enjoyed your story, Andrew. Um, it's um, not just um, it's not just not not useful for um, police officers to turn up on something as minor as a plant pot, but it's also very unlikely, because we mustn't forget the tweet um, very recently about a single police officer being on duty, uh, on duty in Harlow in one particular night, just one. Um, so it is a matter of resourcing, um, amongst other uh, matters like modernisation. Um, so I welcome the fact that Essex are recruiting some additional police officers. I think, if memory serves correctly, they're looking for 150, which doesn't compensate really for the 400 they've already cut. Um, however, I'm happy to work with the um, opposition here. I'm meeting with Robert Halfen very shortly, and this is a matter that we'll, we'll talk about there, see if we can get our MP to uh, support us in encouraging more policing immediately. And um, we're also meeting with the, crime, the Police and Crime Commissioner in the next few weeks, and um, Councillor Edwards, also, you can be assured I shall bring that matter up um, immediately, actually. There will be a letter going out in the next day or two. So, we are now voting on the, I've turned the page too quickly, the Public Space Protection Order, pages 112 to 115. Are we all agreed? Very agreed. Agree. Thank you. Moving on then to communications from committees, working parties, there were none. Minutes of the panel's working groups, pages 152 to 155. Are they so noted? Thank you. I'm unaware of any other matters of urgent business. 